Welcome to Chapter 22 of AMSCO U.S. History, World War I from 1914 until 1918. Keep on subbing, liking, commenting, and sharing these videos with your friends. Thanks so much for your support. World War I started in Europe as a result of militarism, alliances, imperialism, and nationalism. And the United States didn't enter this world war until around 1917. There were many reasons for the United States entering, one of which was a Zimmerman note. Basically, U.S. newspapers found the shocking news of a secret offer made by Germany to Mexico because Germany was fighting as part of the Axis powers in the war, and they needed or wanted Mexico's help. A telegram was sent and intercepted by British intelligence, and this telegram basically was to Mexico from the German foreign minister, whose name was Arthur Zimmerman, and who this note is named after. He basically proposed that Mexico should ally itself with Germany in return for Germany's pledge to help Mexico recover the lost territories of Texas, New Mexico, and Arizona. You may remember those were lost during the mid-1800s in the Mexican-American War. As a result, the American public was aroused by this nationalist anger, and the American people really wanted to convince Woodrow Wilson, the president at the time, that Germany fully expected a war with the United States, so the U.S. finally wanted to go to war. Another factor that contributed to the United States entering World War I was the sinking of the Lusitania, and it was the first major crisis challenging U.S. neutrality because it occurred in 1915, so rather early on in the war. Basically, German torpedoes hit and sank a British passenger liner called the Lusitania, and most of the passengers drowned, including 128 Americans. So once Americans found out about this, they were totally outraged. And Woodrow Wilson sent Germany a strongly worded message that basically said Germany would be sh sh held to strict accountability, and they had to stop its policy of sinking unarmed ships. So ships not used for war could not be sunk, obviously, right? But... Germany sort of agreed to it, but didn't really take many steps to prevent this from happening further on. And on the American side, Secretary of State William Jennings Bryan, who you may remember as the Gold Cross speech, objected to this message as too warlike, and as a result, he resigned from the president's cabinet. So there's even a bit of divide over war with Germany in the United States. The Lusitania was sunk partly because of unrestricted submarine warfare. This was basically one German military strategy that basically hoped to challenge the British Navy at the time, which was basically the most powerful in the world. And so Britain had put a blockade on Germany, and as a result, Germany answered this blockade by creating their own blockade and warning that ships attempting to enter the war zone, which were waters near the British Isles, so sort of between Britain and France, were at risk of being sunk by these German submarines. Well, both sides didn't really like it, and as a result, Germany continued their strategy of trying to sink any ship that came into these waters through their stealthy submarines, which were called the U-2 boats. Submarines were a new invention at this time, so Germany had a really big upper hand with this new technology. Also during this time, there was a War Industries Board. This was basically created during the Wilson administration. And the Wilson administration was, of course, the third of the progressive presidents. And basically, they created hundreds of temporary wartime agencies and commissions staffed by experts from business and government, really trying to help the war effort. One of these was the War Industries Board, and it was led by a Wall Street broker who used his extensive contacts in industry to help win the war. And under this direction, the board basically set production priorities and established centralized control over raw materials and prices, basically creating and shifting manufacturing to things that would help the war effort. So growing food for soldiers or even producing stuff like tanks to aid in the military effort. Another important administration was the Food Administration. This was led by Herbert Hoover, who would ev eventually become president as well. He was a distinguished engineer, and he took charge of this administration. It basically encouraged American households to eat less meat and bread so that this food could be shipped aboard to the French and British troops early in the war, because these places really needed food to keep up the war effort. And this conservation drive basically paid off in two years, the U.S. overseas shipment of food tripled, and it really helped the Allied forces over in Europe. There was also the American Expeditionary Force, led by General John J. Pershing, 
is basically the small collection of U.S. troops ready to see war action if needed. And the first U.S. troops to see action were actually used to plug weaknesses in the French and British lines over in Europe. And by the summer of 1918, when the United States had fully entered the war, these American forces arrived by the hundreds of thousands, and they were even controlling one part of the Western Front in the war in Europe. Back home, socially, there was also a shift known as the Great Migration. At the end of the around 1800s, 9 out of 10 African Americans have li lived in the South, but throughout the next century, this ratio steadily increased toward the North. This was an internal migration where people travel north to seek jobs in the cities, the northern industrial cities. And there are many reasons for leaving the south. For example, there were the deteriorating race relations, so kind of going back to slavery times. There was lots of segregation in the south. Also, the destruction of their cotton crops by the boll weevil, so agriculture was taking a hit. And also, number three, the general availability of jobs, of course, in the northern factories. And these which were opened up while the white workers were drafted into World War I, serving as soldiers overseas. The Great Depression eventually slowed this migration a little bit, but World War II renewed it as well. And while many succeeded in improving their economic conditions, the newcomers to the northern cities also faced some racial tension and discrimination like they had in the south. Congress and the federal government really wanted the full support of the American public behind this war. And as a result, they passed two acts. A number of socialists and pacifists. So socialists are people who wanted more control for the government. And pacifists were people who don't like war at all. Criticized the government's war policy and everything that was happening in America at this time. As a result, the government passed the Espionage Act in 1917, which basically said that you might be in prison for up to 20 years if you try to incite rebellion in the armed forces or obstruct the operation of the draft, basically, if you were trying to screw up America's war effort. Also, the Sedition Act in 1918, which went much further, it basically prohibited anyone from making disloyal or abusive remarks about the U.S. government, so you had to be completely loyal to the government. Doesn't seem many very democratic, and many of them were convicted and jailed for speaking out. For example, the socialist leader Eugene Debs, who you rem may remember from the Pullman strike, was sentenced to federal prison for speaking up against the war. So this kind of didn't seem really American, and it's kind of like the Alien and Sedition Acts back in the early 1800s. Soon after World War I, Woodrow Wilson started to promote his 14 points, which was basically always his ambition of peace without victory. So he really didn't want this war to happen in the first place, but since it did, he had to lead his country through it. He presented to Congress a detailed list of war aims, known as the 14 points, and they were really designed to address the causes of World War I and prevent another world war. So. Many of them were related to territorial questions. So Germany had actually invaded part of France and had to return that. And they also had to leave Belgium and Romania and Serbia because they had also invaded those places. But even more important was a bunch of broad principles for securing peace in the future. And you can read them right here. They basically seek to help countries be more friendly with each other and to prevent war if at all possible. And one important thing was a general association of nations. This last point was the one that Wilson valued the most, and this International Peace Association eventually became known as the League of Nations. The political cartoon over here actually shows Wilson trying to address all the European countries which were trying to recover after the war. The official end of the war came with the Treaty of Versailles, and it was a peace conference that took place out of the Palace of Versailles outside Paris, and it began in January of 1919. Basically, every nation that had fought on the Allied side, which was the winning side, in the war was represented, and no U.S. president had ever traveled abroad to attend this diplomatic conference or anything like it, but Wilson decided to participate because he wanted to promote and defend his 14 points. Republicans didn't really like that he went with a bunch of Democrats. He was a Democrat himself, and not many Republicans, and of course the Republicans couldn't get their voice heard. It consisted basically of the big four countries of the Allied troops, basically USA, Great Britain, France, and Italy at the time. Germany was basically 
disarmed and stripped of many things that they had possessed, and they had to pay huge sums of money in reparations to Great Britain and France for fighting them. Also, self-determination. New countries were established, and during this time, Russia even experienced a revolution where the communists took over. Also, the signers of the treaty decided to join an international peacekeeping organization known as the League of Nations, and each member basically had to stand ready to protect the independence and territorial integrity of the other nations, basically a worldwide alliance now, but ultimately this didn't really work out as well. The Treaty of Versailles provided for a lot of good things, but ultimately it couldn't prevent another world war. Debating this treaty back in America, there were irreconcilables versus reservationists, basically people in Congress who didn't really like this treaty and were opposed to it in some form or another. So these senators, they opposed the treaty, of course, and they formed two groups. The irreconcilables were basically saying that they did not want to accept the United States membership into the League of Nations, no matter how the covenant was worded. So they absolutely hated Woodrow Wilson's idea of this international peacekeeping league. The reservationist faction, on the other hand, was saying they would accept the league if certain reservations were added to the covenant. So if certain things were changed or amended, they would agree. And it was led by Senator Lodge, Henry Cabot Lodge, who's also famous in the imperialist times. And as a result, Wilson basically had the option of either accepting Lodge's reservations or fighting for the treaty as it stood, basically his original idea. He chose the fight and eventually didn't get the support of the Congress, which he needed to get acceptance into the League. And the United States actually never entered the League of Nations. World War I had ended in 1919, but the country was suffering from a host of problems, such as unhappiness with the peace process and other problems in America. There was also the fear of communism fueled by the communist takeover in Russia, of course, with the revolution. And there were worries about labor unrest at home with socialists and communists trying to maybe convert to America as well. This was a problem, and this was called the Red Scare. Also, the anti-German hysteria the wars turn quickly into anti-communist hysteria. Basically, people were originally scared of the Germans trying to invade America, but now they were scared of communism trying to take over democracy. These anti-radical fe fears also fuel xenophobia, which of course is the hate of immigrants. As a result, immigration was severely restricted in the 1920s. This Red Scare was further fueled by a series of unexplained bombings at various federal locations. The FBI, as a result, decided to gather information on radicals. They ordered mass arrests of anarchists, socialists, and labor agitators. These people, of course, were speaking out against the government. Many were arrested based on limited criminal evidence, and most of the suspects were actually foreign-born, and some were deported. The scare faded quickly after, though, because the attorney general who started these raids Palmer warned of huge riots on May Day, which is an annual Labor Day in 1920, but these raids and riots never took place. As a result, he lost his credibility, and with rising concerns about civil liberties and the democratic rights, this hysteria eventually receded. Unfortunately, though, these raids eventually became known as the Palmer Raids as a result of trying to find sort of the infiltrators of American society and government. This has been Chapter 22 of AMSCO U.S. History. Thanks so much for watching and hope to see you in the next one when we continue the story of America.